Hi, my name is Beryl Benassaraf. Uh, whoops, um, is, is it sound okay? Yeah. And um, I'm currently treasurer of, of AIUM. That's forward, okay. Uh, I'm also a professor of uh, radiology and OBGYN at Harvard Medical School, and I work at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And I'm really, really excited about today. I've been waiting for this for like 20 years. <laughs> been really, really an ultrasound advocate for a long time. And I've been fighting uh, this battle <clears throat> um, where, where I live, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be able to bring it here. Now, uh, there are some ultrasound pictures here. I know not everybody does ultrasound, so bear with me uh, as I sort of take you through some of the pictures and illustrations that I have. Now, historical perspective, and this unfortunately will date me, uh, but I went through, I was a radiology resident in, 19, in the 1970s, mid-70s, where there was an ultrasound machine in the ER. And that's what we did when patients came in with problems. Um, there was only one CT scanner at the Mass General Hospital where I trained, and that was just head, for head trauma, and there was no MR. MR didn't exist. So that's where I come from. Nowadays, there's a CT scanner in the ER, and that's where everybody goes first, uh, sometimes without even seeing a, a physician. So, uh, you know, why is it that patients are referred first for a CT scan these days? And what's interesting is that in my practice, I see a lot of uh, patients that are referred to me for an ultrasound after having had a CT scan that didn't understand what was going on. So uh, how have we evolved to ordering the most expensive imaging technique first, followed then by an ultrasound, which actually solves the problem? So doing a CT scan first for female patients, particularly young patients, uh, for lower abdominal pain is dangerous. It's, it's harmful, it's wasteful, and uh, uh, it's, it's expensive. <clears throat> so why, is CT <coughs> why are CT scans so popular? Well, they represent volume imaging as opposed to ultrasound that's al always been a two-dimensional modality. CT scans give you a whole volume very quickly and so that you can look through all of the multi-planar uh, um, images within that volume. Uh, and it's also easier to perform because it doesn't take as much personnel time as the machine really does all the work. Well, this is all changing because ultrasound now has 3D. And ultrasound can actually generate these beautiful volumes that CT and MR did for so many years. So that has moved ultrasound into the modern era of technology where we're now able to do uh, many of the things that had been relegated to CT and MR for so many years. So what I want to talk about are basically, I mean, I could talk about this all morning, but I won't. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, we're just going to talk about these four things. Um, ultra, uh, uterine shape abnormalities, um, IUD positioning, uh, adnexal masses, and endometriosis, uh, four of them really most common issues. Uh, that we, we come across, and now they are possible with 3D ultrasound, whereas before the MRs were actually uh, ordered for, for these things. Now bear with me, this is a, a, a normal, let me just, a normal uterine cavity with 3D ultrasound. This is reconstructed. This is how nicely you can get ultrasound now. This is reconstructed. There's a catheter inside the cavity. It's filled, uh, the cavity is filled with fluid, and you can see the nice triangular shaped cavity as opposed to this septate uterus in a patient who has recurrent miscarriages. And this is really uh, a, you know, a, an image that is um, very diagnostic and where nothing further needs to be done other than to you know, take care of the septum so this patient can be uh, fertile. So ultrasound and uterine abnormalities has really risen out uh, uh, more recently um, as really the modality of choice. And there is a lot of data. Uh, actually, the biggest study is from Alfred's group uh, showing that uh, if you compare, uh, uh, if you look at the PubMed uh, search for articles comparing MR and ultrasound on the diagnosis of uterine abnormalities, you'll see that ultrasound, 3D ultrasound is actually better uh, for the most part, or at least as good, but certainly better in many people's hands. And I think that 3D ultrasound will emerge as the standard and has emerged as the standard. And believe it or not, there's still people ordering MRs uh, for, for this. And it's really very, it, it, it depicts really, really well. I mean, here are two patients that have septi, uterine septi. They're, they're not nicely triangular shaped uterine cavity. This one is short and fat, and this one's long and thin. 
And uh, when we do, do these images, we actually print out an image, give it to the patient to bring it to her appointment so that actually they can see, the patient can see and the referring physician can see exactly what needs to be done. So very easy to see these things. And some uterine abnormalities are very complex where you have a heart-shaped uterus, so you have the top of the uterus heart-shaped, you have the septum, and then you have the double cervix. So you can really map out the entire uterine shape, even if you have to do multiple volumes to sort of hone in on the specific areas that you want to look at, namely the cervix versus the top of the uterus. <clears throat> now when these patients go to surgery, then uh, 3D ultrasound is a great tool for looking at how they did. So here is a septum, subseptum. These are the most likely to be associated with recurrent miscarriages. And here she comes back having had surgery, which really leaves just a little divot here, which is very nicely done. So we do follow up uh, these patients. Now moving on to abnormally located IUDs. Now here's an IUD. Um, and look at how 3D ultrasound can really just demonstrate the positioning of the IUD. It even shows you the string. I mean, how much better can you get? You see the string of the IUD, no wonder she couldn't feel it, it doesn't, it's not long enough. Um, and there are a number of IUDs now that are misplaced. I mean, they're not placed there to begin with, they probably slide, but uh, none, nonetheless, they're in the wrong place. And as we see more and more IUDs now with the Mirena IUD and the hormones that are associated with the treatment with the Mirena IUD, we see more and more of these patients. And we actually did a study recently looking at all the patients who came in with IUDs for whatever indication, and we had 167 of them. It turns out uh, that 16.8% of them were significantly embedded or misplaced in the uterine cavity. And as it turns out, 75% of the patients with an abnormally placed IUD presented for pain and bleeding versus only 35%, 34.5% of those with normally placed IUDs had pain and bleeding as their indication. So clearly uh, that was a significant um, uh, difference. And so patients who come in, and this is a 2D ultrasound, and you can see the shaft of the IUD and you can see the arms of the IUD here in transverse section, but with a 3D ultrasound it makes a whole difference. You can see where the IUD is with respect to the uterine cavity. Here's the cavity, that nice triangular shaped cavity. There's the IUD way down in the cervix. No wonder she's having pain. This one looks like an anchor. This one's totally upside down. I mean, I don't know how it ended up that way. And then we have a problem with patients who, uh, whose uteri are too small for the IUD. And we're finding out that nulliparous patients have a rather small uteri. And this one never deployed, because there's no room up here. So we are using a 3D ultrasound to help uh, not only identify patients who really should not be having the IUD, but patients who are symptomatic that we can actually see where it is and solve the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the problem of pain and bleeding for those patients. And then we have some bizarre IUDs coming from different places in the world. These are two IUDs from someplace other than the United States, and you know, this shows you how well you can depict them. This is the Eshore, which, are, which is used in the United States as a uh, tube um, to occlude the, um, uh, the uh, tubal orifices. Now going on to the third area that I want to talk about, and that's ovarian masses. Uh, it's very important uh, to evaluate pelvic adnexal masses and to do it accurately so that if a patient has ovarian cancer that we can identify it early. Uh, and if she doesn't have ovarian cancer uh, that we can avoid doing unnecessary surgery for something that is going to go away or is completely benign. So this is a group, a large group in Europe, IOTA uh, group, which has 19 centers throughout all of Europe and this is a very large study of almost 2,000 patients with pelvic masses. And uh, of those, um, almost 1,400 were benign, 373 primary invasive, and then 11, uh, um, uh, 111 were borderline, and then we had 58 metastatic tumors. And what this shows is they had a model for uh, looking at ultrasound findings to predict, and they also looked at it as a subjective assessment. You look at the mass, you say, is it malignant, is it benign, if you are very experienced. And both of those um, showed a very, very high um, uh, accuracy 
in uh, deciding whether something is malignant or benign. There's, uh, the, li the positive likelihood ratio was 11, and the negative likelihood ratio was 0 0.14. So very accurate, excellent ultrasound discrimination between benign and malignant, just by morphology and um, uh, just looking at it on the ultrasound. So just to show you what we're, we're dealing with, this is a mass by ultrasound. And it's a mass that has some cystic areas, you can see here, and some solid areas. And if you turn on the color flow, Doppler, you can see blood flow within these solid areas. That's a lot of blood flow, very disorganized. Tumors have a lot of disorganized angiogenesis and a lot of blood flow. This is ugly. This is an ovarian cancer. And also, when it's determined that it's not ovarian cancer, uh, there are specific diagnoses that can be made and can be made accurately. Is it a dermoid? Is it a hydrosalpinx? Is it a, an endometrioma? These are also quite specifically made by ultrasound, by looking at ultrasound. And this shows the, that you can actually use ultrasound to make a very specific and accurate diagnosis. Now this is an example of how we use ultrasound to make a specific diagnosis. This is a big mass. Cystic mass has these cystic areas, as you can see. It doesn't have so much uh, solid areas as our last one did, but it, you know, it's a very nondescript mass. But with 3D ultrasound and the inverse mode of 3D ultrasound, which is very technical, but you can take a look at this in a three-dimensional space and find that it's actually tubular. And it's a hydrosalpinx, it's a tube. So we have a lot of technology at our fingertips now within the ultrasound machine that we didn't have 10 years ago that enables us to do this kind of work. Now going on to endometriosis, this is a typical endometrioma. Um, it, it's a cyst and it has this ground glass appearance. It's often associated with a hydrosalpinx because it's, it's, uh, um, it makes for a lot of adhesions and stickiness in the pelvis. But I think that what ultrasound has gotten very good at recently uh, because everybody knows that ultrasound is good at seeing cysts, but what ultrasound is good at seeing recently is the implants of endometriosis in the bowel wall. This is a loop of bowel here. This is the lumen of the loop of bowel. This is the normal wall on this side, and that wall is all nodular and thickened. You can see it here. These are implants of endometriosis. These are very, very p uh, painful and tender, and there are a lot of, there are thousands and thousands of women that have this tenderness back there in the cul-de-sac, in the back. And uh, that is associated with the rectosigmoid endometriosis, which is extremely common. And it was always MR that was touted as the, the way to go. And now there's data very strongly suggesting that ultrasound is very, very good, if not better than MR, uh, at least as good um, in, in accurately detecting uh, rectosigmoid endometriosis. And what you do with ultrasound is you do a tenderness-guided ultrasound. So you've got the probe, the vaginal probe, and you can poke a little bit. And the patient will say, oh yeah, no, that's where it hurts, and that's where you look. Uh, and so we can actually do an exam at the same time as we do the imaging to guide us to the place that actually hurts. And that's one of the reasons why ultrasound has become so accurate, uh, because we're doing an exam at the same time which is an added benefit from actually uh, doing the ultrasound exam ourselves. Now this is, this is amazing. This is a recent study um, that was done. I, I don't understand this, but I mean, you, you really can't make this up. But the study done to see the added value of ultrasound following a CT scan in the ER. Now doesn't that sound backwards? So the ultrasound changed the diagnosis of the ovaries now next to 8% of the time. Ultrasound changed the diagnosis for uterus 12% of the time. And you know, um, you wonder, why was CT done first? I mean, why wasn't it done the other way? I mean, don't you think this was sort of the cart before the horse? I mean, shouldn't they have done the ultrasound first and maybe add how much CT, asked how much CT adds to that? I mean, that's what we have to do if you really want to know the answer. So the last area that I want to talk about the last couple of minutes is that the radiation risk of CT, we've talked about MR, but the radiation risk of CT, which is what these patients come in with pelvic pain and get, uh, is, is really astounding. I mean, if you look at um, that 69% uh, uh, of patients in 2005, 2007 had at least one imaging procedure involving radiation, CT scanning and nuclear medicine accounted for 75% of the accumulated dose. 
20 tests with the largest distribution, uh, contributions of cumulative effective radiation, including CT of the pelvis and abdomen. And another study showed that, of course, we've had a huge uh, increase in CT scanning since 1993. An estimated 29,000 future cancers would be related to CT done uh, in the U.S. in 2007. Uh, the largest contribution of this projected risk of cancer, 14,000 cancers were attributed to CT of the pelvis and abdomen. So this is really dangerous. Uh, this has cumulated it and is really dangerous. So in conclusion, ultrasound is safe, free of any radiation. After decades of widespread uh, use, it has no harmful effects. Um, and even in the human fetus, we have trouble finding any kind of harmful effects that we can hang our hat on. Ultrasound is accurate in the diagnosis. I've shown you data to show you that, uh, that ultrasound is accurate in the diagnosis of pelvic masses, causes of pelvic pain, infertility, uterine shape abnormalities. Ultrasound has acquired 3D now, so there's no excuse. Ultrasound has acquired 3D, so it can uh, give us images that are similar to CT and MR and other forms of uh, volume imaging. And ultrasound scans and ultrasound machines are much less expensive than CT and MR. So that's why I strongly believe in the female pelvis, ultrasound first, the way to go. Thank you very much.